Hey, what's going on out there? I hope everybody's doing all right. We're back again, yet again. Spooky Software is back again. Uh, today we're going to be taking a look at um, <clears throat> kind of an interesting optimization, that, a little trick I learned a couple years ago. Um, just a, another way to make your applications a little bit faster, a little bit more secure, and um, you know, just uh, reduce complexity a little bit. Um, so one thing I see uh, developers do often is, um, uh, you know, maybe they're working on like some kind of business app, like some kind of web business app, and they have this, you know, all these databases or maybe just, you know, one or whatever. Um, and they kind of get in this mode where the database is sort of this catch all um, solution for a lot of problems. Right. And uh, so what ends up happening is actually sometimes I see developers using the database, um, doing writes to the database um, to s sort of store things that actually you don't need to store um, and where we can actually use instead maybe a more optimal solution might be actually to use cryptography um, and like something like an HMAC signature to verify something, sort of guarantee something without doing any writes to the database. So um, to sort of concretize that, um, I have made this repository here. This is just, um, you know, a project that's written in Rust, but um, this would be applicable, of course, in any programming language. And, you know, Rust is relatively readable. The, prob the parts of the Rust code base that I'll be looking at in this video um, are very small. So you, sh you should be able to read this even if you are not familiar with Rust. If you are not, there's an entire web series about uh, learning how to write Rust. If you're a um, experienced programmer but you don't have any Rust experience, um, there's a whole web series on this YouTube channel. You can check that out. But um, hopefully the parts that are relevant to this are you know totally readable and understandable. Um, so this this repo, as I was saying, sort of demonstrates and codifies. Uh, when you can actually avoid using database writes and use cryptography instead. So um, we're gonna take, take a look at two case studies um, that you see all the time in sort of your standard application, uh, things like creating new accounts with verified emails or uh, resetting a password, you know, via some potential like, you know, forgot password functionality or something like this. Um, and we'll take a look, we'll sort of think about how we might implement it, you know, sort of the naive way using the database, I say naive, but. It's not really a naive thing. It's just sort of the de facto standard of how someone might solve this who's writing a business-driven, you know, database application. But um, so uh, let's let's just sort of take a look at this and sort of come up with some requirements for how this is working. And then we'll, then we'll take a look at the code and see how it works. And also to briefly discuss uh, how we might do it with a database instead if we were to use a database and why we're not using a database in this case. So... Um, Oftentimes, you know, this is like a really simple thing, right? You have some kind of sign up form, right? And you basically ask the user for their email address because you're going to send them an email. And the idea is that there's some link in there that they can click. And then by virtue of clicking that link, um, they're able to complete the sign up process, maybe, you know, type in username and password or whatever. Uh, and the idea is that we, sort of the invariant that, you know, systems want to enforce is that um, uh, we don't want any users without a you know, emails that are working, at least at, as of the time of sign up. And uh, typically what I see people do is like they'll, you know, they'll have a user's table, you know, some kind of user entity, right? And um, they might have like a, like verified marking on this thing. So they'll maybe like during the sign up process, they'll like create a user in like a unverified state. Um, and then like once the user completes this sign up process, you know, clicks that link in their email, they'll like turn that, you know, verified, you know, Boolean or whatever to true and then, um, you know, kind of move forward from there. But uh, so there's a couple areas of complexity there, right? We have this additional Boolean that like is only really useful for like, you know, the first, let's say, a couple minutes of a user's like sort of life cycle. You have to deal with this for the, you know, the remainder of, uh, you have to store this forever, essentially. And um, you also oftentimes have to deal with it later when you're like, uh, you know, sort of maybe doing some authorization code. You might like check if a user can do something. You might also have to check if they're a verified user because you don't want these like half users to do things, right? So um, instead, uh, what this application does, and we'll take a look at this in a minute, um, is actually it doesn't store anything. And during the creation process, the link that is generated that would, you know, go to an email um, just cryptographically signs an email. And therefore, you know that, oh, you know, when, when the URL comes back, um, we know that we sent it, you know, and we know that the user who says they are had access to that email, et cetera, right? And we'll take a look at that more concretely. Um, 
another case study, which is uh, kind of in the same vein, is uh, resetting a user's password, right? So uh, the general idea is like, you know, user clicks forgot password to type in their email and, you know, you send them a link, uh, you know, with some kind of like token in it or something uh, that will like allow the user to reset their password. Um, and so usually what ends up happening in this case, again, um, and this is maybe a suboptimal solution depending on your requirements or whatever, but, um, you know, somebody else might create like another table um, and they might have like, you know, a row for the token itself, like this secret, uh, the user ID that is associated with, and then maybe like an expiration time. Um, and of course, uh, once you have this row or whatever, you know, your database supports, um, you have to manage the life cycle on this thing. So uh, you have to like, you know, periodically maybe clean out old ones or uh, maybe delete them when users sign in or something like this. So um, there's some persistence here and some complexity dealing with the life cycle of this thing. And so um, also generally speaking, this, this kind of case study and this one to an extent, but this one's more obvious. Uh, this is sort of the idea of like a single use resource, right? Um, and this is where cryptography really shines um, because you can sort of create this like stateless thing that someone else can reuse at a later time um, without persisting anything at all. Okay, so now that we have this kind of requ these requirements in hand uh, and in our heads, um, we're just going to take a look at how this actually might work. Um, and uh, so let's let's just pull up some code here. So this is the README we were just taking a look at. So I'm just kind of browsing through here. Um, we'll just take, I guess, a, a glance at the main um, program here. So uh, a lot of the stuff I'm going to just quickly breeze over. So writing this project, I definitely went way overboard, <laughs> uh, you know, way more than I needed to, to actually demonstrate the parts that I wanted. But, you know, I was also taking a look at some of these uh, Rust libraries and sort of getting a sense of where the ecosystem is, for instance, for the, uh, with a web server, right? Um, so um, this has a, a web server going. This is using um, Rust's new feature of async await. I'm not going to talk about it at all in this, but uh, essentially there's a library called Tokyo, um, which is an executor for asynchronous tasks. Uh, if you're a like JavaScript or like uh, maybe an async Python programmer, this should be relatively familiar with you or for familiar for you. But um, the general idea is just um, working with tests asynchronously, you know, over maybe um, multiplexed over connections or something like this. Um, and so I'm using uh, um, a library called warp um, and that's just the router. So this is like, you know, so there's a path called slash list uh, slash reset password generate. Um, there's another one for resetting the password itself. Um, one for creating a user, um, dealing with post and gets, uh, and then of course, uh, recovering from errors and this kind of stuff. So this is mostly HTTP stuff, right? And all this stuff is like for decoding uh, or encoding, um, maybe form, uh, or query arguments. Um, and then, so up here in the handlers, uh, so, you know, we have a handler for, uh, handle errors. We have a handler for that list. Uh, so let's actually take a look at that in the browser. I actually have this running. So this is just on localhost. I have the slash list and here you can see, I have sort of a, uh, a fake, um, user database listed out here. So, you know, users have a name, some kind of ID, an email associated with them and a password hash. And we'll take a look at, you know, we'll actually utilize these fields more, uh, in the, when we start talking about the features that I was just mentioning earlier, but, um, so the, the important parts are, for instance, um, so let's actually execute this, right? So if I want to like, for instance, reset, uh, Linus's password here, uh, so I can click this uh, little link here. And so this is, um, the application is actually generating this URL at this point, right? Um, and so I would send this to them in an email, but you know, I don't have any email set up for this demonstration. So I'm just going to click this link here, um, and head here, but you can see, we can just take a glance at like what this URL looks like. Okay. So there's, uh, you know, some route and then there's a user ID, which is, um, of course, Linus's user ID here. And then there's an expiration date, you know, some kind of Unix timestamp here, as well as this token thing. And this, you know, might seem pretty close to what you would do if you were persisting this information in the database, but there's no persistence here of any of this information. And so when we arrive here, um, what really happens is the user hands back all this information to us in the server. And so, um, 
as a result, like when I, you know, change this guy's password, so let's take a look at what this is. So right now it's a hash that ends with BJE. If I change this to something else, something else, okay, we do this. Um, we should, when we refresh this, we should see a new hash and we do. And so um, let's actually take a look at the implementation of that. So uh, reset password is, okay, so here's uh, where we generate that URL. Um, so that was that page uh, here. Uh, you can basically see the URL is created from some parameters. And so this is where the guts really is, is in this verify reset param. So let's take a look at that. I'll pull up the verify. Uh, and we're at reset params. And here we can see that, oh, those uh, query arguments we were just talking about, they are part of this struct here. So there's some basically binary token here, uh, you know, the exp expiration data, user ID. And so to create that thing, Let's actually look at that. Um, so we create an, uh, an expi expiration date, which is going to be you know three hours from now. Um, and then what we do here, this is sort of the key key insight is uh, we take this information, you know, the user and this expiration date, and we accumulate a um, HMAC, right? So this is a SHA uh, SHA three two fifty six. Um, we have some secret key, right? So this gives you an opportunity to use all your standard. Uh, you know, security practices at your shop for rotating keys or whatever. So there's some, um, so, so some secret key, right? And we basically uh, put in that hash in that, in that signature. We put in the user ID and the expiration date. And so what that allows us to do is later when we actually execute the reset, um, we can actually verify that just looking at the signature. So let's take a look at that as well. Let me just make this a little bit bigger. So, um, Where's the post here? Here we go. So we take that information from uh, the URL, right? There's those reset params, expiration token, and user ID, as well as the form params, which is gonna be the new password. Um, and so we actually verify that right here. And so we say, if this user and this user uh, URL params match what they're supposed to be, uh, that signature is the same, um, then we actually execute the reset password. Uh, and that's really all that goes on here. So let's just look at that verify function and, and, and um, just make sure it makes sense to us, right? So again, we pass in a user and we first of all make sure that expiration date is, you know, um, before now, right? And then once we're sure that that's good, um, we again accumulate this signature given a user and an expiration date and then we call verify. And so uh, this is part of the HMAC library. This is a verify function. So the nice thing about this is uh, most HMAC libraries will have this built in where they have some kind of constant time um, uh, um, comparison, which is important for security, for timing attacks and all this stuff. So um, the idea is, A, is the signature we expect exactly the same as the signature they gave us, right, in the URL. And so again, there's no persistence of this anywhere. This is all just computed uh, sort of at the moment, right? Uh, and we know that um, basically since we are the ones who control this super secret key, we are sort of using cryptography to guarantee that we were the ones who generated that original URL, right? That came through the email or in this case um, was just generated for us. Um, okay, so that's that. Let's take a look at the other piece of functionality. And it's gonna follow a very similar type of thing. Um, again, so this is the new user functionality. So I'm just gonna click this and this would be like, okay, so you're signing up a new user. So we'll just, uh, you know, test at spookysoftware.dev. So we, you know, we would send this person an email. I'm just gonna click this link here. And again, we can see from this URL, we're kind of getting, you know, the same feelings as we were just a moment ago, where inside the URL, they provide us an email and some token. And, you know, intuitively, we already know how this is gonna work, right? We're gonna sort of ensure that this email, this piece of data was signed with our secret key by verifying this is the hash we expect, right? This one up here, this token, right? So as a result, I'll just put in a new thing. Hello, hi, okay, create that thing. And we should see a seventh user here, which we do, right? Um, and so there's no, again, there's no persistence of this uh, user until that final forms, form is actually submitted and you know the user's already in a verified state at this point. And to sort of ver uh, just drive home this point of how cryptogra uh, cryptographic signatures actually work, um, if I just refresh this, right? And so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna change the email. So like I'll say test two. Um, 
what this is really saying is like so some hacker who's trying to like abuse this system somehow they're like oh i control test two at spooky software um they try to you know use the same token if i do this you know and add some stuff it doesn't really matter uh you know this signature no longer matches uh and so therefore they can't do this um so that's pretty much the the nuts and bolts of how this actually works and the only thing I'm going to do here is um, I'm just going to address kind of one additional thing, well, maybe two additional things um, to keep in mind. And um, so somewhere in here, if we take a look at the um, create user, so there's some, there's some create user callback here. So here's the get and here's the post. Again, this is this is all stuff, you know, here, so here's those parameters from the URL. Here's that form information that they typed in about name and password, et cetera. Um, and we're just doing this. And so again, we verify that signature is correct. So there's one additional thing I just want to I want to note here is at some point, once we verify the signature, we're, you know, we're calling add user. Um, if I take a look at that function, add user. Um, you know, so this is building up a user, it's, you know, locking a database or whatever. Uh, but you can actually see I'm doing a duplicate check inside the add user function. Um, so I, I want, I don't want to create a user if someone's already using the email that the person is trying to use. Right. And so, um, you actually do this here at user creation. Um, and you have to remember to do this because just because you're, cryptographic signature matches just because you've actually verified the integrity of the URL. Uh, it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, that email that the person is using is still not duplicated. Like I think in the sort of old use case where you would create an unverified user, you might do this duplicate check at the moment you create the unfair unverified user, but now you have to remember to do it here. That's just an additional note. This is just sort of something to watch out for is usually you have to do all of your verification at the moment you verify the signature. Um, yeah. So you have to maintain these invariants potentially at different times. Uh, one other thing I do want to kind of try here is, um, you know, let's say, let's just add an additional requirement. This is a, a new a new wrench in the thing. So I just want to make sure that uh, we can actually handle some more use cases than besides these basic ones. But um, perhaps in the future, uh, a new requirement comes down and uh, people in security are like, hey, we want those um, reset password. We want them to only work once, right? So, uh, you know, they send in an email and then they click it and then they reset their password that should essentially invalidate the that link. You know, so like if it's sitting around in someone's email, someone else can't like sort of hijack their computer and use that link anymore. Um, and so we might feel at this point that we're like kind of screwed with this cryptographic approach, right? We say, oh, like, you know, too bad. Like now, now is a reason for me to persist those tokens, right? Because I can actually delete them and make them invalid, right? If I had some persistence, but we can actually still do this requirement using cryptography. So. I'm actually only going to change one line here. Um, so somewhere in here, oh, it's in the, I'm in the wrong file. So uh, in the reset, so right now we're what, what we're actually verifying are that we signed the user ID and the expiration date. But if I do one additional thing here, um, like you know, just one line here, I'm just going to say uh, user dot password into bytes uh, and I need to save that okay and so ah, so it wants me to okay all right and so I'm just gonna reset this you know re-rerun re this and again so this is um so what I've actually done here is uh, I've actually signed the person's current password as part of uh, the signature. So that means that in the future, if they change their password, they should not be able to actually reuse this link, right? So let's actually let's actually verify that. So come back here. I'm just going to refresh this. Okay. Uh, I'm going to reset Eric's password. 
Okay, so again, the link looks very similar. And also note that I didn't put the person's um, bcrypted password in this URL. You could, uh, although I did not because uh, this information is persisted. The person's hashed password is persisted. So I don't need to, although I could. Um, and so again, you know, I'm just gonna reset this person's password. Let's actually um, verify. So right now it's a SG, right? So let's change that. Okay, that was successful. And we noticed that their hash did in fact change, right? So what I'm gonna do here is I'm just going to um, go back here and I'm gonna try to reuse this link. So this is a, a, the same link I just had a moment ago and I'm gonna try to change the password. And what I expect is to get a uh, token error. And so of course, this makes sense now because this, this token here, included their previous password as part of the signature. And so now that it includes the new password, the verification does not match the current state sort of thing, um, it doesn't work. And there we go. So again, we haven't persisted anything new. We've just added more information to the signature and therefore we can get things like one-time use tokens. Okay, that's pretty much it. Thanks for watching. Um, of course, all this, pro all this code will be available um, on GitHub, I'll link it in the description. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me, you know, either a pull request or whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, definitely this project is uh, <laughs> probably potentially a little bit overkill. And there's some things in here that like kind of distract from the core part of it, but nonetheless, uh, hopefully it's pretty straightforward. Okay, thanks for watching.